Okay. Um, it looks like the number of people joining is starting to taper off. So uh, why don't we get started? Welcome back to the, the final um, question and answer session for um, the MET Plus training series. Thank you so much for being with us. This, uh, in essence, marks the, the 20th session that we've had since, um, you know, the, the start of this back in no, uh, late November, early December. And, uh, you know, I just wanted to, to say thank you for your attention and, and for asking great questions. And, um, you know, feel, please feel free to uh, give us um, constructive feedback. I believe John Opatz is going to be um, sending out a survey or I will be sending out a survey um, within the next week just to, to get um, input on um, how well this um, training session went and then um, allow us to plan for an advanced training session in the fall. Um, the scope of which uh, kind of depends on how much funding we receive um, from all of our different um, partner organizations um, in order to, to put this on. Um, and then just a, a quick reminder to go ahead and, uh, you know, if you haven't already, register for the MET Plus Users Workshop, which is the 27th through the 29th of June, um, where we're going to be having presentations demonstrating the use of MET Plus as well as discussions about how to contribute to it and um, you know what the future should look like for, for MET Plus. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I think I'll turn this over to, to John. You wanna take this away? Yes, okay, thanks Tara. Um, so uh, just like last time, if you weren't here for that, um, I've divided up the questions that we received over the past, I think two weeks or so um, from Slido into a few categories. So we're gonna attack those categories. Uh, if uh, if you don't see your question, um, you know, in the first place, even if you were first in Slido, um, don't worry, we will get to you. It's just this grouping kind of made sense to us. Um, and then again, for everybody who is on the Met Plus team, if there is anything that needs to be added um, or anything that needs to be uh, corrected, especially what I'm saying, um, by all means, feel free to jump in and uh, provide some better context and better details on these things. Um, but for the time being, let's start with the first general question. Um, so that one was, I've noticed there's not a lot of examples of using regrid data plane. Um, if I wanted to run that tool with Python wrappers, how would I go about doing that? So uh, I want to bring it to um, the askers uh, attention that there are actually a few examples of running the regrid data plane tool, but they're in the Met Plus side. Um, especially with the Python wrappers. Um, so if we go to regrid data plane, I'll pop that up. Um, you can see that uh, the 5.1.22 is filled with regrid data plane, and one of them is using Python embedding. Um, it gives you a basic rundown of scientific objective. The data sets are usually simplified, especially when you're just running a, a basic met tool wrapper, um, but that's to give you a better understanding of how to run this yourself. Um, and same with the Python script that's used to ingest this. You can see that the read ASCII numpy um, is what we're going to be using for the OBS um, field. And then it does um, down here allow you to click on that. But because this is in the MET repository, you'll have to go over there to read the script. Um, but this should be a good place to get you started on, writing, um, on running the uh, regrid data plane. I also wanted to bring to your attention that there's additional use cases because those ones are very simplistic and basic um, so that you can get a better grip on how to use it in your use case. But if you want to see how it might be intertwined with other tools, um, using the, on the left-hand side under user's guide under quick search for use cases, um, number six, you can see that we can go to regrid data plane and you'll get all instances of use cases where regrid data plane was called out in the keywords. Um, so that'll get you some, uh, a little bit more uh, complex uses of that tool and maybe that will be um, what you need. Um, but hopefully between those two, you'll have a good kickstart of how to uh, use that tool in particular, especially with uh, Python embedding. So um, are there any other questions from the asker on that? Okay. 
Go on to the next one. Um, what are the differences between Ensemble Stat and Genens Prod? Ensemble Stat has been used to get the mean from members. Should Genens Prod now be used instead? Um, and to be honest, this is one of the questions that we get fairly frequently ever since the introduction or ever since we introduced the idea of uh, splitting Ensemble Stat into two separate tools. Um, that's totally fine and that's understandable and it's good that we have some curiosity on this. And really, ultimately, the idea is this is a way to help clarify what this tool does beforehand. Um, it seemed like Ensemble Stat was trying to do two very separate and distinct things, um, but it was created in such a way that it kind of had to. Um, so it seemed like the right time to finally split them up. Um, and so I know that uh, John HG, you added some stuff at the end. I'll give you a moment to speak on that. Uh, but in the uh, for the current time, uh, this is a good um, idea of what Genin's prod is all about up here is that it just generates simple and ensemble products, the mean, spread, probability, et cetera, from graded ensemble member input files. So it's this is just going to be where you're getting the simple ensemble products. If you jump over to ensemble stat, you're going to get things that are more created simple ensemble forecasts. And again, it's, it's a small change, um, but it is a very important one. And if we go back to the Q&A back here, I kind of grabbed a little bit of what Johnny Chi has said on this before, that um, Genens Prod does the ensemble post-processing and product generation without any observation data. So you'll only be working with the ONS dictionary, the ENS dictionary of the config file. You won't have your forecast. You won't have observational data. Um, but you do write gridded NetCDF output files that contain your ensemble products, like your mean and your spread and stuff like that. And you can also still process climal mean and standard deviation files. And that's kind of important because of some of the um, capabilities that have been included in the latest generation of MET for Genens Prod that you can now calculate um, your uh, uh, normalization. Um, for your ensemble, and those need to have climal mean and standard deviation. And on the flip side of that, ensemble stat continues to verify ensemble members versus a point and or gridded observations. You can process your forecast and observation dictionaries just like all your other uh, statistical observation or statistical analysis tools um, of the config file. Uh, it writes out the stat and text output files for computed statistics, and you can also get a gridded NetCDF output file for fields derived on the fly, um, which I think that was done in one of the most recent, again, releases of that. And then uh, I just added the note here. So as you may have seen, especially in that uh, header for Genens Prod, that so if you're calculating ensemble mean, you, you should probably be using Genens Prod in the future. And then Jai Shi, did you want to speak to your note on um, removing capabilities from ensemble stat? Sure. Um, yeah, so I wanted to point out that um, since MET version 10.1 was a minor release, we didn't want to remove functionality from 10.1. So we left Ensemble Stat largely as is in 10.1, um, including the Ensemble, the ENS Ensemble Dictionary and the Ensemble Stat config file. However, we're going to be removing that support for that in version 11.0, which is the next major release we're working towards. Um, so if you uh, are currently doing ensemble post-processing using ensemble stat in 10.1, you'll need to switch over to doing it via gen ons prod for 11.0. And when you do that, uh, when you run with 10.1 ensemble stat, if the ensemble dictionary is non-empty, then you do get a warning message telling you exactly that, that in 11.0, that support will be removed. So I just wanted to uh, make that clear. Yep, and that's an excellent point, John. Thanks. Um, are there any other questions on this topic? Or if the asker has any more clarifying questions they'd like to ask. OK, sounds good. We'll keep on keeping on. Um, John, looks like you've got this one. Can you go over um, the convolution parameters in the mode config file? Sure. Um, yeah, so I added a link here. You know, th this is largely information that's in the um, Met user's guide. So I added a link to the mode configuration section for details. But let's go back. So I, or actually, um, yeah, let's go back to the Google Docs so I can so I can read that. Um, 
So by convolution parameters, really what I interpret that to mean is basically um, how we define objects in mode. So for those, uh, so mode is the method for object-based diagnostic evaluation. We take a raw field and resolve it into ob objects, which are basically areas of interest. And then rather than computing statistics directly on, you know, point, point by point, grid, you know, grid point by grid point, we compare a forecast grid, gridded forecast or grid analyses by resolving objects in each and then comparing the objects uh, between the two fields. So the user has a lot of control over how they want to resolve those objects. Um, and the, there are two main parameters that go into this. One is called the conv radius for convolution radius. The other one is called conv thresh for the convolution threshold. And then there's some other related options at the bottom, but the convolution radius is basically, um, you take the raw value at each grid point and you replace it with the average value computed over the points and the, uh, the, the nearby grid points. And so we use a convolution shape of a circle. And so any grid points that are within, uh, you know, the, 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 that convolution radius um, in grid units of that point are included in that average value. So really all we're doing is we're taking the raw field and we're smoothing it. Um, and if you set it to, if, if you're dealing with data that's already very smooth, like perhaps pressure, um, you can set the convolution radius to zero, which effectively skips the convolution step. It, it just, you know, the inputs, the output. Um, so after we've smoothed the data, we apply a convolution threshold um, to, to uh, to define zeros and ones. So um, any, and then any two grid points who are who meet the threshold criteria are that are adjacent are included in the same objects and grid points that meet the threshold that criteria that are not adjacent, um, well, they would be they would be in different objects. So we basically resolve that threshold field into objects. And so um, and I note note that I say that meet the threshold criteria. You know, usually mode was originally developed on precipitation data. So you would say precip greater than some amount, but you can you can run it on whatever uh, field of data when where when you look at it, it you you the eye naturally sees objects uh, uh, appearing there. So you could do it. It could be less than. It could be exactly equal to. There, you know, you it's up to you to define the both the, the threshold value and the type, whether it's greater than, less than, exactly equal to, not equal to. Okay. So then related options: the sensor thresh and sensor val. Um, when you're reading the raw field, raw data in. Um, you can do data censoring where you define one or more thresholds and one or more replacement values. So the example I like to give is if you're comparing a forecast of reflectivity greater than 35 dBZ, where you have values of 35 at grid points surrounded by values of zero, um, to if you're comparing that to an analysis field where you have a full range of reflectivity values, both above and below 35. So since that convolution process includes, you know, you're smoothing data, if you have 35 surrounded by zeros, that will really change how the smoothing is done for the forecast field relative to the observation field. And I'd recommend using uh, the sensor threshold and sensor value option of that to, to, um, to change any values less than 35 in the observation field to values of zero. So that the forecast and observation fields are defined in a, the same way so that when you apply the convolution parameters to them, you get a kind of objects that are comparable. Um, valid thresh is a configuration option that defines how much valid data must be present in the convolution area to compute a smooth value. Um, that's described more in the in the user's guide. And then once you've resolved objects, the filter attribute name and threshold are configuration objects that um, whereby you can uh, discard objects that don't meet some criteria, such as a certain length, width, or area, or raw intensity percentile value. I would say how this is often used is if you haven't done very much smoothing then of the data, um, you, meaning you set the convolution radius small and you end up with a handful of uh, small objects that are just a few pixels here or there, um, you may wanna set a minimum area threshold for it to be included uh, in the analysis. Um, there's a merge thresh and merge flag. So the merge threshold option is if you basically have uh, th these can be used to apply double thresholding logic, merging logic. So if two objects are distinct at a higher threshold, but are part of the same object at a lower threshold, this logic can merge them together into the same cluster object. So um, 
yeah, why, I, hopefully that addresses the the, the question about um, convolution parameters. I'd refer you to the um, user's guide again, that, that mode config section, and then um, also you're welcome to follow up with any other questions via um, GitHub discussions. Thank you. Thank you for covering all that. And I, I know it's a lot. Um, I guess uh, the the interest function, I, I haven't been able to find any information on these, like the ratio if and all that. Is that is that basically changing how the convolution views data farther out from the radius, farther out from the center? Or I'm I'm confused on the those parts of the interest interest function. Ah, okay. Yeah. So um, what Wesley's talking about is once we have objects defining the forecast and observation fields, we compare them between fields to see how close they are. Um, and the way we do that is ultimately by computing a total interest value for each pair. So if you have five forecast objects and three observation objects, we would compute up to five times three or 15 object to object comparisons. And for each comparison, we get a total interest value between zero and one. And this is where the fuzzy logic comes in in mode. So basically, you define object pair object attributes, and um, and you assign weights and interest maps to decide how um, how much each component can matter. So one example of them, it, one example of a pair of, of of one is the area ratio, where you look at the the ratio of the forecast object area to the observation object area. And then you say if that if that ratio is close to one, then these thing these objects are more similar. And so um, there is something called the ratio interest function, or, or um, so so there's both interest functions and confidence maps. And what we're talking about here is the interest functions. And so basically those those piecewise linear functions in the kinetic file um, for each for each pair attribute like area ratio, they define what good is. So an area ratio of one is a good match, whereas centroid distance, basically the distance between the, the centers of mass of the two objects, a, a, the centroid distance of zero is a good match. So that's that's how the, we, we, we take the, uh, the pairwise attribute as input to the interest function, and then it hands us back the value between zero and one that tells us how well these things compare. And, and then the result, the total interest function is a weighted value or a, a weighted average of the interests of each of the pairwise components. Um, but yeah, I can, I think perhaps looking at a, um, a, pres, a you know, Randy Bullock's presentation about mode or um, that, that might be useful or reading more in the, in the user's guide. But again, I can, Wes, I can clarify any other questions via email or on GitHub discussions. Uh, Wes actually just posted an example of what he's asking about into um, the chat. I don't know if you want to take a quick look at that. Yeah, so, so this is the definition of a piecewise linear function. So um, x, y of 0, and then is um, 0, 0 is the first point. The last point is one one, and then there is a shoulder where um, where defined by corner and one point zero. And I don't know what corner is defined as. It's probably point seven or point eight or something. Um, so this is just you know piecewise linear function where um, we pass as input the um, area ratio and we get out the interest that for that area ratio for that pair. Uh, you know, yeah, actually, here, here's what I'll recommend. Try running mode at verbosity level like 10 and then look at the log output. And it dumps out very detailed information about the computation of the interest values. I will do that. I didn't know the verbosity went that high. I'll, I'll start experimenting. Thanks for going. I know it took up a lot of time. Thanks for going in depth on this. I appreciate it. Sure. I, I, and um, Wes, I, I just wanted to point out to you that um, you know you pulled out ratio if, um, which is on line one fifty six of the mode config file. Um, if you look right above that on line one fifty five, it says corner equals zero point eight. So um, in essence, the config file is trying to demonstrate that you can have um, some additional 
flexibility and configuration in it. So um, the, the value of corner, <coughs> which is 0 0.8, is then um, plugged into the ratio if piecewise um, function um, where the word corner comes in. So it's kind of like an algebra equation in some ways. <laughs> so uh, I guess is it is it saying that values close to the center are more are weighted less heavily than values close to the edge or I, I just don't conceptually I, I don't understand what it's like. What it's so in, in this case ratio you an optimal value of ratio is one. So what it's saying is that um, if you're looking at a ratio like an area ratio or something like that if it's somewhere between 0.8 and one, then we're really interested in um, in those pairs. But if the the ratio between the, the two pairs is you know like at point two, then we're not interested at all. So anything above point eight, you want anything below point eight, you don't. Correct. Well, Got it's it isn't it isn't that below point eight you don't want it. If it's if the ratio is point seven, then yeah. you know, so these are three points on an x y plane zero zero. 0.81 and 1, 1, right? And so that those this is the definition of a piecewise linear function. And so anything, if, if it's a value of 0.7, then the interest value is going to end up being like 0.9 or something. So whereas if the ratio is near zero, then the interest, the corresponding interest value will be near zero as well. And so let me let me clarify since we're going into depth on this one. The area ratio I mentioned, it's a forecast area divided by the observation area. area. That isn't totally correct. It's the maximum or it's the minimum of those two divided by the maximum of those two. And so that gives us, that forces us to have a, a ratio between zero and one. And that's why this interest function does not need to go greater than one because we're, the way we're defining the area ratio is the min divided by the max. We're always going to get a value between zero and one. So if I'm expecting a, you know, a kind of a decent spread in you know forecast the observation area i should adjust my corner down to allow for the mode to say that okay well maybe they're not all that similar but maybe that's not all that bad you know you you could do that i i think it would be it, it would be just simpler to change the weight for the area ratio so right now you know each one of these pairwise uh, object attributes has a weight and if you set the weight of the area ratio to zero then it won't be included in the computation of the interest or in the total interest value. Right, so in okay. general, I would say changing the weights is, is easier and uh, I think less will cause less confusion in the long run. Okay. There's just a lot of nuance in it. I, I thank you for going into it in depth. Appreciate it. Sure thing. Yeah, yeah and it's it's definitely one of the benefits of mode. Uh, it's configurability, and it's also one of the curses. I just wanted to also add that um, so these this uh, documentation will be uh, available for everybody to read. So if you do want to go back and revisit just the the listing, this will be available to you. So don't feel like you've lost anything. If we've covered a lot of material, especially on mode, um, so uh, just for your benefit, it'll be there. Um, I do want to actually jump to a different question um, very quickly because it is tied to mode as well. It was asked um, pretty late um, yesterday, so we didn't really have a chance to answer it or assign a responder. Um, but maybe uh, if George or Johnny G can speak to this, any known issues with mode object verification and match merge processes working poorly with fields having values of either zero or one, vice of their whole range? um of either so basically if you're running mode on a binary field as input i think that's what the question is versus yeah versus a you know full range of values so um that's correct yeah you know the the original motivation for mode was a, you look at a field of precip um this is what randy bullock always says and he he took off his glasses and he saw everything was blurry and when he saw when everything was blurry he saw kind of areas of interest. And so uh, it, and that, you know, kind of led to the led to the development of mode. So um, I would say it really just depends on the the um, the data. So if you have a, you know, field of temperature 
where there's no bullseyes and it's all pretty uh, relatively smooth and you take your glasses off and objects don't jump out at you, then it probably isn't a good application of mode. Um, whereas if you, you know, if you have areas of high and low pressure um, where there are bullseyes and features really jump out at you, then it would be a good application of mode. As far as the uh, binary field, you can do, still use it. Um, if the binary field has, is already nicely defined into areas of interest, then you might choose to use a convolution radius of zero, which would basically pass through the binary field to the object definition step. If you want to smooth the zeros and ones, you can. And um, by defining a convolution radius greater than zero, and that will give you, after you do the convolution process, you'll have values between zero and one. So some of those ones will have been averaged out or averaged down lower than their, their, their binary value of one. And then it's up to you to define the convolution threshold. Ultimately, it's really up to you to de decide what is the feature in the data, what is the scale and the feature of this feature of the data that you're trying to capture and study. Um, so, um, Really, it, it can work fine on binary inputs as long as the data lends itself well to an object-based approach, approach in, uh, from the beginning. Thank you very much. Likewise, thanks, John. Okay, so um, going back up to our original question in the order, um, what are the capabilities of MetPlus in evaluating moving nest simulation with reanalysis or other statistic data or other static data apologies um, so right now I will say to start things off there are no current use cases demonstrating this capability um, so this is uh, another call for it. we're looking for contributions from users so if you do have a use case that you feel is good enough that demonstrates this in the metplus um, uh, uh, realm um, by all means, please get in touch with us and we can work with you on getting this submitted and checked out and potentially getting it into the repo because um, ultimately this is a tool for you. Um, so if if you think it's useful, if you think it's set, that would be great to have. Um, after speaking with Johnny G about this, the concept is probably within Met's capability though. Um, it would probably require uh, regrading analysis files to the forecast domain. Um, and having to do that at every um, hourly step. Um, and then you'd also have to give some consideration to a possible changing verification domain, um, which would have you changing what your masking region is going to look like. Um, and then really the most important step is just to make sure that uh, the file search and acceptance of by MetPlus is there of the corresponding tools. So you always want to make sure that whatever tool you're reading in or whatever file you're reading in, no matter where it's coming from, starts small, like a, a plot data plane um, or even a regrid, and make sure that your file can be read in. And then if it can be searched and read in by a simple tool like that, it can probably be read in and used in this way in like a grid stat or point stat. I do see that Tara has her hand up. Um, yeah, so I, I just wanted to point out that um, the moving uh, nest um, evaluation is analogous to other um, types of looking at areas of interest um, uh, evaluations that uh, MetPlus has been used for, or at least Met has been used for in the past. Um, what comes to mind is the hazardous weather test bed where they identify a domain of interest every day. And, um, you know, the evaluation is performed over that domain of interest. So um, in this case, the, the nest is following a, a tropical cyclone or, or something like that um, for hazardous weather test, but it's, you know, um, over a particular region of um, the United States where they, they feel that there might be severe weather. Um, so uh, we, I, we have not used MetPlus in, in its current instantiation. Um, on HWT um, data, to the best of my knowledge, unless um, within the within some of the work at RAL for the um, high impact weather test bed um, evaluations, um, you know, if, if they've done that. But it, it really it, it is possible to do this, and it is possible if you think of that that moving nest as a you know just a, an area of interest um, to uh, accumulate or aggregate those those results. So it is very doable. Sorry, didn't mean to raise my hand again. 
Excellent. Thanks, Tara, for jumping in and responding. Is uh, If the asker is online right now, did you have any further uh, clarifying questions? OK, sounds like we're good. And like I said, thanks, Tara, for clarifying that, yes, this has been used before. At least it can be very easily. Um, just how you think about it. And uh, yeah, I want to mention that if you have a contribution, especially in the TC realm, um, we are always open to those. So feel free to reach out. Um, the next group we're going to jump into is the file input. Um, so somebody received a segmentation fault error during working with GFS Grib 2 files. How to solve the problem without converting these files from Grib 2 to Grib 1. Um, so Julie answered that one, um, but she's not here today. So just I'm I'm going to let um, the person who had um, the issue read this here and as well as the rest of the group if you want to. Um, but I think this boiled down to just somebody compiling met with an incorrect flag. Um, and I think, Johnny, she, you responded to one below this kind of like that, but I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Is there anything that you thought of during this one when you read it? So, um, yeah, it, basically, if you're using GRIB2 data, um, so there is this frustrating thing, <laughs> this dash D 64-bit flag. And so uh, met links to the grib 2 c library um, to, to read grib 2 data from, and that's provided by Noah, I believe. And um, so this 64-bit this flag needs to be set consistently in met and the grib 2 c library. And when it's not set consistently, then um, basically we, we've, we've seen this sort of issue where there's a seg fault or there is a... Um, out of memory issue um, where it, it just isn't reading, basically reading data from the GRIB2 file correctly. So whenever there's problems reading GRIB2 data, the first thing we always check is to um, make sure uh, to build, let's see, Julie says, given that problem is important to build both the GRIB2C library and MET without the D64 bit flag. And the thing that's frustrating is that it, by default, I believe it is included in the GRIB2C library. So um, that's always the first thing I check whenever I, there's a GRIB2 issue. So I would say uh, try to resolve that or verify that that isn't the source of the issue. And if you're still having uh, problems, then we can follow up via discussions. Excellent. Thanks, John. Um, the next one, uh, the next question was, I got a little bit more context and it made a little more sense after discussing it with the, the asker. Uh, a package that I've used in the past converts GRIB2 to GRIB1. I've always wondered why. Could it be due to the error that George mentions, which George in this question, in this instance is the asker of this question right here. I received a segmentation fault. Um, after uh, conversing a little bit, it sounds like um, the... Uh, the package in question is not um, MET plus. Um, it's just a, a file that read in um, some forecast files and converted them from GRIB2 to GRIB1. And it sounds like that capability may have been done because of a size restraint um, with, uh, I think, the GRIB1 files or the GRIB2 files. Um, so... I'm not quite sure that this is relevant, the the dbit flag. But as John she said, when you are having that with a met tool, by all means, um, please check that first. Yeah, hi, John. So basically what I was trying to get at with this question, it, at first I thought maybe something, uh, well, the reason why, and it is met plus. Uh, this is related to met plus, and it is a con using the convert grid function utility in it. And I just always kind of took it at face value and just, you know, have gone with it. And then it just came up with um, the pre a previous question. I just made me uh, think about it more is why I'm wondering, um, wanting to convert GRIB2 files to GRIB1. So I guess basically what this is getting at is, is the, and I was thinking of maybe like a size thing or just to get the files to be, to work better um, being GRIB1 uh, with NetPlus and just as a general kind of thing. Um, so I guess the main question that I'm getting at here is, is it better to, to, to convert GRIB2 files as GRIB1 
and it's a better thing to be using GRIB1 files versus GRIB2, or is there any kind of distinction like that, or is it perfectly fine if you were to say, if I would, I haven't tested this, but if you were to take out that convert GRIB function in the script and just leave it as GRIB2 files, would there be any like issues that you could foresee, or would it be okay to just use GRIB2 files instead of converting it? I guess I'm not quite certain uh, what the differences are between GRIB2 and GRIB1. Tar, do you came off mute? And John, she also did. I'll let John answer, but if, if I don't like his answer, then I'll, I'll fill in. <laughs> so um, GRIB1 is much older, um, and GRIB2 is intended to improve the format um, by making it a little more flexible. Um, Met can, you know, Met can read, should be able to read both GRIB1 and GRIB2. Um, just fine. And when you, you know, if if we run into problems with either format, then we'll fix those as bug fixes. Um, I would say the general, it's taken many years, but in general, most data, GRIB2 is preferred for most data sets. Um, mm -hmm. But, I, you know, it can, so that's my perspective on it. Yep. Okay. Thanks. I can, I can test it myself. I can see you know, taking out that conversion factor and just leaving the files as group two and just making sure everything works fine as is too. I can do that myself, obviously. So thanks. This is just more of kind of a clarification and just if by chance it had anything to do with the previous question. So thanks. Let me let me also point out that convert grib that which goes between what can convert between grib one and grip two and also vice versa um, is great when it works and sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, because if there's metadata conventions that it doesn't know about, it will bail out and, and tell you that. Um, whenever I have issues or questions about GRIB data, um, I, I often will use Panoply, which is a visualization software provided by NASA, I believe, um, to independently visualize the data, just so I can kind of as another point of reference. Um, and you can also read GRIB data into, uh, with PyGRIB into, into Python. So when you're, you know, trying to develop, uh, trying to test out or figure out where, where things are going wrong, having multiple tools to process the data is often useful for debugging. All right. Thank you. Um, hopefully that answers your question or at least gets you uh, further down the path. And again, as always, if you continue to have issues, feel free to open the discussions um, question and uh, we'll get to you that way. Um, I think that was it for the file input output um, grouping. Um, so the next one is going to be a TC related. The question is for computing tropical cyclone intensity and trackers, is there a portion of the data prep that can be done outside of MET plus? So yeah, the general workflow for um, track and intensity verification of hurricanes in MET. Um, and these are done by the TC pairs tool in MET. Um, and then the results can be further filtered or summarized by the TC stat tool in that. And the typical workflow is that someone will run an NWP model and generate gridded output. And that gridded output is run through a post processor, which writes GRIB1 or GRIB2 output often. Um, and the unified post processor or UPP is one uh, that, the, the, that the DCC has been supporting for several years, but that support is being discontinued. So that's an, kind of an area of concern in my mind. Um, Anyway, once the model output is in is in GRIB format, it's often run through a vortex tracking vortex tracking software, such as a G, GFDL vortex tracker, and there's a that that's also supported by the DTC. Um, I'm not sure what the long term support plans are for that, um, but anyway, it writes its track files in the ATCF file format, um, which is basically just a customized ASCII file format. And that is the input to the TC pairs tool. It reads the forecast ATCF data, which is really just at each point in time where the uh, you know the the predicted location of the storm and its intensity and radius of wind and all, all these details. Um, so that's the the forecast ATCF is often compared against um, best track data, which is a human um, analysis 
of the uh, of where the storms actually did occur uh, that's produced by the National Hurricane Center. Um, so that's a typical use case is you compare forecast ATCF data to NHC provided best track data. Um, however, you can configure TC pairs to compare uh, tracks from derived from two different forecasts or a forecast and its own analysis track or, or the track of another or the analysis track from another model. Um, but really I'm just emphasizing here the input to the TC pairs is the ASCII ATCF file format. Go ahead, Tara. Yeah, I, um, I just wanted to point out that um, the the unified post processor and the GFDL tracker, the support for those are actually moving over to NOAA EPIC, which is the Earth Prediction Innovation Center. So there, there will be continued um, uh, community support for um, those packages. It's just uh, a matter of when they'll be transitioned over. So UPP um, is in is being transitioned over to EPIC um, this year. Um, and GFDL tracker, um, we're not quite sure when that's going to happen, if it's going to be next year or the following year. Um, but th they're not going unsupported. They're just um, transitioning away from the, the developmental test bed center and our support of it. Thanks for clarifying that, Tara. And I'll make a note of that in this doc. Okay, thanks. So then the question is, do we answer, um, you know, this person's uh, questions or are there any others that are out there? Yeah, I, I have a question if you um, if you don't mind. So the UPP, I don't remember during the TC pairs and TC stats, I don't remember talking about UPP. Um, was that just because it's part of the internal workings of uh, TC pairs and TC stat? Um, actually, UPP is a, a post processor that, that falls in between the running of the model and before MET, um, MET or MET plus picks up um, the, the data. So it's um, what takes the, the output from the native um, model domain or grid and, um, you know, post processes it into something that is standard projection on standard pressure or height levels and, and so forth. So it, it's actually ahead of MET plus. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So for thank instance, you. For instance, EMC uses UPP routinely to um, generate the the um, grids, the um, output files that they make available to the community. George, could wondering if you could come off mute and are there? Can you remind me? Are there any examples of MetPlus use cases that call the track the GFDL vortex tracker directly? Yes, there's one use case that calls the tracker. Um, it is under the Met Tool wrapper use cases, under the GFDL tracker directory. So that's pretty nice that you know Met Plus has a flexibility. So whereas Met is compiled C plus plus code and the tools do exactly what they are supposed to do, we have kind of the flexibility with Met Plus to define wrappers as needed to do additional things to solve science problems. And so I think. Having enhancing Met Plus to have the ability to call the tracker as one of its steps, I think, is a fantastic enhancement. And sorry, I misspoke. There are actually three use cases: um, one for Genesis, one for tropical cyclone, and one for extra tropical cyclone. Thanks, George, for pointing that out. And yeah, I'm super easy uh, with the documentation to be able to get there um, quickly. So um, let me actually grab this and just drop this in the chat so everybody has a copy of it. There you are. OK, um, so with that, we'll move on to our last questions. Um, I think we only have two left. Um, and they're both pertaining to the MetViewer MetExpress. So um, the, the first question was, in order to get or install MetExpress, must the database used be the one supplied uh, by MetPlus, or could an existing post GRESQL database be used instead? Um, Molly Smith uh, provided the answer. She wasn't able to be able to hear able to be here today, so I'm responding for her. Um, but the short answer is that no, you can't use any database with MetExpress. It needs to be the same sort of database you'd use with MetViewer. Um, so unfortunately, you won't be able to use an existing one instead. Um, 
I, I personally can't speak to any other questions on this one, but if you do have any questions, um, please ask them right now uh, for the person who asked it or if anybody uh, has clarifying questions on this and we'll see if somebody on the line can uh, provide you with an answer. Okay, hearing none, we'll go on to the final question. Um, so the scorecard question, similar to another question, which is the, uh, the one I just read, must the database used to produce a scorecard card by the database be provided by MedPlus? Um, Jai Shi, you've got this one? Yeah, um, so yes, the way MetViewer, uh, MetViewer um, generates scorecards by reading data from a MetPlus database, um, I put, put a link there to the Met Viewer documentation about scorecards to, to point out that there is configurability and flexibility in the statistics that are included in the scorecards and, and you know, the, the colors and symbols and that sort of thing. But yeah, the assumption is it's all uh, pulling data from a Met Plus database. Um, I wonder if Minna or Hank or Tatiana, if they're on the call, is there any other perspectives on that? Like, Will scorecards be able to be generated directly from MetPlotPy, or will that remain a thing that's done by MetViewer? I don't know anything about that. Uh, that's probably something we could ask Tatiana. OK, thanks. Any other discussion about scorecards? I, I, I guess I will just. Um, uh, put a word out there that I, I feel that it is a desirable um, capability to have scorecards be able to be generated from, uh, for instance, flat files of submit um, output and not necessarily always from a database, um, especially considering uh, operational centers such as EMC um, may need that in the future. So uh, if it's if it's not already available or in process, um, we'll be looking at an issue to, to make sure that that becomes available. Um, but my question out to EMC is, is that, am I interpreting that um, desire correctly? Okay, apparently I'm, <laughs> I'm just making it up. Um, and then Austin, you're the one who asked this question. Um, is that something that NRL needs? I know that you already have scorecard capability, um, but is are you looking for additional functionality? Um, uh, thanks, Dar. I'm I'm at GMEO. Um, oh yeah, sorry, but, awesome. Yeah, but yeah, I was. Uh, I mean, that is interesting to know that it can uh, generate from uh, a, a plot file instead of the database. Or I mean, that that's, it, a, that, that's a useful uh, capability. Yeah, sorry, sorry about that, Austin. I, I got you mixed up with Wesley, but um, I, so so the answer though is at this point we we need to check and, and see if that's um, possible. If it's not, um, and if it's desirable, um, then you know we'll try and um, build it into our our development plan. But um, if it, if it's not already available, um, we also you know need to look at the the broader context um, and and uh, figure out how to get it funded that that particular development. Great. So, I mean, in that case, you could have a you could have your own different database where you can still pull stats from, and if you can get it in the right format, then you could use MetPlus to make the scorecard. Um, I think it's pot it's potentially feasible to do that. Yes, um, we, you'd have to put it into the the um, the format, the temp format that MetViewer uses um, to compute the, um, the statistics that build the scorecard. But um, if that's something that you're interested in, um, once again, reach out um, via discussions and we'll try and engage Tatiana in it. Um, she's not you know, available today, unfortunately, um, to uh, help you understand what the temp file looks like so that you can move forward with it. Okay, great, thank you. You bet. All right. Um, with that, I think that's the end of the questions that we received. Um, are there any other follow-up questions or anything that, uh, any questions that were asked here today that sparked different questions? 
um, that you think can be answered in nine minutes or less? Okay. Um, Tara, I think that's it for us today then. I guess so. I guess everybody gets 10 minutes back of their, their time. So, um, Sorry, one last question here, which you probably yes. already answered. Um, so I find the, uh, the index page of the past uh, lessons and everything, which include the recordings and the presentations to be very useful. Are you planning on keeping them for a while or is there a plan date where you're going to pull that down? Oh no, we're we're going to leave that um, as is, um, and because uh, we feel that that is uh, the best source of um, training material that that we've been able to um, accumulate over the you know the past year or so, so it will remain that way. Um, and then when we um, uh, announce an advanced um, training series, hopefully starting this fall, um, you know it's very likely that we we will just continue to use this page and just add to it. So um, please point your um, your other Met Plus enthusiasts um, to the page. Will do. Thank you so much for all the time and effort. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, so uh, to, to be honest, in some ways, I, I do want to um, put this into perspective. So we had um, 20 sessions, 21-hour um, sessions. So that's 20 hours of training. To be honest, that's about the same amount of training as we would um, have for a, a two and a half day training session if it were in person in Boulder, maybe like right after um, you know the Wharf Users Workshop or, or excuse me the Wharf um, uh, tutorial or, or something like that. So um, so uh, in essence, congratulations on completing um, you know the Met Plus training. Um, uh, as a team, we're very excited that we were able to present it this way because I, I think that it allowed for people to um, to uh, learn the material in you know smaller bite-sized chunks. However, we do feel that there's um, definitely uh, lots of things that, that were left out. Um, and so uh, once again, um, we're going to be putting together a survey. Um, expect to see it coming out sometime in the very near future. We would love to get your perspective on whether this one hour format um, once a week worked well, or if, um, you know, maybe going for like a two hour format um, once every two weeks or, or you know, two hours every um, month or, you know, whatever it is, um, if that would make a, a little bit more sense because it would give us a little bit more time to really, um, you know, uh, present the material and then give um, more hands on, on um, demonstrations and so forth. So, so think about that. Um, as well as what topics uh, you would like to see in the advanced um, training. For example, you know, we can do more um, uh, exploration of things like mode. We have um, other spatial methods um, that we would, you know, we should introduce. Um, there's the use of climatologies. Um, there's additional um, use of, of, you know, all the process-oriented diagnostics um, that have been added. Um, there's even, you know, how to contribute um, to the Met Plus repository, um, contribute your methods and so forth. Um, so on that, um, do we have a question? No, we just have thank yous and, and you are very welcome. Um, so any last questions? Otherwise, uh, we'll now give you six minutes back of your day. 